So when I was doing my degree, I halfway through my degree, I was depressed because I was like, I can't even deal with doing these like modules because a lot of yeah. them were very heavy, like yeah. gender violence and all this type yeah. of stuff. And you're thinking, how can I do a job like that? If my degree is making me feel sad, how can yeah. I do a job like in this field? Yeah. And then when I discovered fraud and white collar crime, I was like, oh, everyone was asking for experience. Mm. And then I was like almost close to giving up at this point. So sometimes it's about preparing for opportunities before they even come. Yeah. Sometimes I think we get focused on that linear progression. I'm not going to lie. I take up space. <laughs> <laughs> I don't um, I don't feel like I have ever shied away from my potential. Yeah. So as much as at the time I was looking at it, almost turning my nose up at it, like, oh, yeah. I don't think this is going to be that great. It actually turned out to be the best decision ever. So in total, I would say about five years. Wow. To get to the head of yeah. um, level. What, what do you think about the whole thing about job hopping? Do you think that has an impact on, I guess, your career? Welcome to the Takeoff Experience, where I sit down with highly driven people to talk about their journey, their failures, and their successes. If you want to take off in your career, your business, your finances, or your mindset, then this podcast is for you. This episode is sponsored by Money Hub, a secure money management app that helps you to manage your money with ease. The Money Hub app provides you with a single view of all your accounts by letting you connect your bank accounts, your savings accounts, investment accounts, your credit cards, all in one place. To help with your money goals, Money Hub has features that allows you to track your incomings versus your outgoings every single month and also allows you to set and track your spending budgets every single month too. It's a fantastic app, right? Well, you can download the Money Hub app for free by tapping the link in my description. You can use the Money Hub app free for six months with no auto renewal. And if you really like the app, then you can continue using it for only £1.49p per month. It's a deal of the century, right? Well, make sure to go and download the app right now. Enjoy the rest of the episode. Welcome back to the Takeoff Experience. We have a special guest in the building. Shay, how, how are you doing today? I'm good. I'm good. Thank you for having me. Very, very welcome. Actually, it's, it's, you know, I've been wanting to get you on for, for a little while, so I'm really looking forward to uh, this conversation. Um, so just wanted to start. Who is Shay? Oh, I love that. That's a good question. <laughs> um, so I would say I, um, so my name's Shay. Um, for those that don't know me, I work in financial services. I head up a financial crime department. So my career has predominantly been through financial services and preventing financial crime. I also have a platform, an Instagram page and a YouTube channel that talks all about career progression, financial well-being, and just day-to-day -day lifestyle. And um, outside of that, I also have a wedding planning and coordination business as well. So I would say in a nutshell, that's Shay, but there's definitely more more parts to me. But I'd say those are like the main things. So. Wow. It's crazy. And we're going to go, we're going to get into how you balance all of that, because that's a lot. <laughs> that's a lot to be doing. Heading up a financial department, financial crime, you said, right? Yeah. Financial yeah. crime department and a business on the side. That's a lot. That's a lot. But anyway, we'll, we'll, we'll get there. We'll get there. Um, Just wanted to go back. Where are your parents from? Nigeria. Nigeria. Yeah. And were you, do you know if you were, of course, some people don't know though. That's why I always ask this. Yeah. Were you born in Nigeria or here? I was born here. I was yeah. almost born in Nigeria. <laughs> almost I was born. almost, almost born there. <laughs> My mum was heavily pregnant for me when she came here. So really? Like, it was like very touch and go. Like yeah. if she spent any longer, I would have been born in Nigeria. Yeah. But yeah. And I know that you, you go, it seems like you go to Nigeria quite often actually. Do you know right. what? Not as often as I'd like. Really? So um, my dad lived there like my whole life. Mm. So up until the point that he passed away, he was there my whole life. So I tried to go back like at times, mm. but I definitely have not been back mm. enough, um, like as much as I would like to. What do you think when you go there? Like what's your point of view of Nigeria when you go? Like how, how do you find it? I think it's difficult because mm. with Nigeria, it's technically home. That's where like a lot of family is. Yeah. So I feel that for me, it's not always the best experience. Like okay. it's like, I enjoy it as a country. Like I think yeah. it's like nice, but it never feels like a holiday. I feel really? like I want to go there and actually like in, have a holiday. Whereas mm. for me, it's like not really a holiday. Like mm. I'm spending loads of time with family, having to entertain family, all of that sort of stuff. Whereas I feel like I've never been to Nigeria and just gone there and not told anyone I was there. Really? Actually, no, that's a lie. I did that once. Yeah. No, I had to tell my dad, obviously. My dad was <laughs> there. So it was like my dad knew I was there, but like my siblings and mm. like my like mum's side of the family, no one knew I was there. 
And that's probably the time I probably had the most fun because it was Real. like, I was kind of left to my devices <laughs> and I could just enjoy the country and just like take it all in. Yeah. But every other time I've been, it's been very full on like with family. So, yeah. yeah. Everybody but wants to see you, I guess. Exactly. Right? You have to see yeah. everybody. You know, you can't be going there empty handed. Yeah. So it's you like can't always a very expensive people, what, trip. <laughs> what, what, what do they ask you for? Because I get, we get some interesting requests sometimes. We've, we've gotten Marks and Spencer's tissue before. <laughs> what? How did they even know about that? <laughs> people know isn't it people know people know so we get like interesting requests what, what's like the most interesting request that you've that you've gotten to you bring no, back from over here no one's ever asked me for anything too weird you know mm. i think it's just always that expectation that you would come with something yeah with so something. i don't think anyone's <laughs> ever been like bring this i've been i've been asked to bring like my sister asked me to bring e45 but i think she okay. said that the ones that they get out there are fake or something so <laughs> I don't know. Maybe she was gassing me for ten. E forty five. That is quite specific. But though. yeah, she yeah. told me to bring E forty five. But I think outside of that, I don't think I've ever had like a specific request. It's just always yeah. that, you know, without saying they yeah. expect to. Be yeah, they to expect bring something, something, right? Yeah, that is interesting. But I do, I do, I do get it though. To be fair, right? Yeah. Like yeah. it is like you know you haven't seen them in a long time, and yeah, is it is it interesting thing? Um. So okay, so you said you were born in London. Whereabouts uh, did you grow up in London? I grew up in South East London. South East, okay, cool. What was it? What 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 ends? What, what ends in South East? Do you, so do you I was say or nah? no, 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 okay. I'm 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 proud. <laughs> I know some people <laughs> don't like to be, but proud South. I'm proud. South London. Um, no, so I um so we lived like sort of like Surrey Hughes, Deptford, mm. like pretty much. Okay. Then went to Bermondsey for a little while, like cool. a few years, and then came back to that same part, cool. and then moved to Peckham like eight years ago. I okay. Think. So yeah, basically those areas of South is where I'm familiar Ooh. with. And what was it like for you, like growing up in the area? Like, yeah, what was the childhood around then? It was fine, you know, yeah. it was, I mean, my mom didn't really let me out. So really? <laughs> to be honest, okay. yeah, I wasn't really allowed out like that. Okay. Um, and I, I think I didn't start really going out like with my mm. friends and stuff until I was probably like a, pro like a teenager. Okay. Um, so I didn't really go out. Like, you know how everyone got to like play out on yeah. the bikes and stuff. Mom wasn't letting me out. Really? No. <laughs> Do you know her reason for that? Was that just be she because was, she wanted to be strict? Or? She was just strict. I really? think she was okay. just strict. I think cool. she was also really um, protective as well. I think mm. that she had this mentality that letting us uh, be a bit too free. Maybe yeah. we would get ourselves into trouble. Yeah. I think there was always a lot of talk about kids getting involved in like yeah. gangs and things like that. And I think she just thought, the way I can stop this is just don't let anybody go out. <laughs> so, Fair enough. Yeah, so I wasn't really like, but my childhood was fine. Like, yeah. I mean, even despite not going out, I still had a good social life because mm. I grew up like with my mom's church and stuff. Mm -hmm. I made a lot of friends at church, people okay. who I'm still friends with now. Okay. And there was like a big youth community in my church. Yeah. So that was okay. good because then if I did want to go out or do things, we'd mm. always do stuff together. So. Okay. Wow, that's good. I think that's a good compromise, right? Like not just completely being strict and be like, okay, you could not do anything. You can't have no, no. It wasn't like that. Like my, I was allowed all, right? to have friends over. I was yeah. allowed to go to their okay, house. I was allowed cool. to do some stuff, but yeah. I wasn't like. So, for example, you know how some people after school they yeah. were able to just like still go out after yeah. school. No, no. Like the okay. one time I tried that with my mum, and I was like, my friend was like, oh yeah, let's just like go out after school. We wasn't even doing anything. We were just like yeah. walking around Deptford, not doing yeah. anything like productive i think i got home like maybe six seven that day trust me i never did it again <laughs> never okay. even dead i get me. it mad oh my gosh <laughs> that's crazy and uh school wise what like were you the type to were you really into your studies at school yeah you i would were? say that okay. i was yeah um i actually enjoyed studying i think okay. there was like points maybe where i probably didn't push myself as hard as i knew that i could okay. but i definitely like switched that up as the years like went on but yeah i i was like quite academic actually cool and what if we're taking it through to, to, to university, what what did you end up studying at university? Criminology. Really? Criminology? That's so interesting. I wanted to study that. I wanted to do law and criminology. So what was like the inspiration for that? What why why down that path? So I don't know. I'm really weird, but I'd always been like really like interested in crime. So okay. um it started from like my obsession with like CSI and stuff. Okay. And I also I like CSI as well. So okay. I also did I did law at A level. Yeah. Um and but I did law at A level oh. because it was kind of like my mum just told me that you're doing law. It was yeah. like there was not she didn't understand other subjects. So it was just like <laughs> you're doing law and that's it. It was either law or Bad. medicine. So yeah. I think that to like satisfy my mum I did law yeah. as like an A level. Mm -hmm. But then I didn't I was just not interested in it. I yeah. didn't find it enjoyable. Yeah. I found it really difficult to like take in a lot of the subject matter yeah. and then when I started like doing a bit more research and then I found out that criminology was a course that I yeah. could do and it more delved into the actual crime aspects and yeah. things that I felt like I was actually interested mm. in I was like yeah I'd, I'd want to do that yeah. but yeah I was just obsessed with like 
crime scene investigating. And okay. Like that. Wow. So I thought that's crazy. doing a degree like that would get me closer to that sort of a job role. Yeah. That's insane. That's so interesting. You know what? I did want to do criminology, but the reason why I didn't go into it, I think it's because I felt like it wasn't, I think I did research and it wasn't well paid or something like that. I can't remember now. Yeah, see, that's the was, thing. Yeah. At least you even did research. Me, I didn't yeah. even think about, oh, what jobs can I do after? Yeah. In my mind, I was just like, well, I, I want to be a crime scene investigator. Is that what it was that end goal at that <laughs> Yeah, time. but I hadn't done like, no, this was literally just like off glamorizing those shows. Because okay. it wasn't just CSI. It was yeah. all types of shows like that. Yeah. that I, they were my favorite genre of TV to watch. Yeah. So in my mind, I was like, oh, maybe I could just like do this and then I can do jobs like that. Yeah. But I never knew like what type of jobs you could do after doing yeah. criminology. I think when I did look into it, it was things like going into like the probation service yeah. and all these type of st type of things. And yeah, I wasn't interested in any of those things, to be honest. I think I just did it because I thought it might be fun. <laughs> mad, mad, mad. And then what did you end up doing? What was like the first job after uni? Like, how did you navigate there? So I was already working at the bank when I graduated. Okay. So I was working for okay. Santander when I okay. graduated nice. from the bank. Nice. And I think around that time, I was still trying to figure out what I wanted to do. Yeah. I knew I sort of wanted to remain in financial services, but I just wasn't sure. But doing criminology, actually, there was a, a module that I did on white collar crime. Okay. And that module yeah. also spoke about fraud, spoke mm -hmm. about bribery. It spoke about all these things. And I thought, oh, this is actually kind of interesting. you yeah. know. Um, and then I was like, that's where the interest, I would say, for fraud peaked. But I yeah. still wasn't really sure what type of jobs. I was just like, this seems quite interesting. Okay. And then um, I, after I worked at Santander, I then got a job at the financial ombudsman service. So okay. dealing with like oh, consumer complaints and disputes. Yeah. And then from there, I was exposed to doing loads of complaints around fraud. So people okay. who had been victims of fraud or yeah. been scammed and then the bank didn't give them their money back. So yeah. they brought the complaints to us. Yeah. So that's when I really got a good understanding of like fraud and financial crime and stuff. And that's when yeah. I was like, yeah, that's what I want to do. Okay. So that's oh, wow. That's, kind of solidified. that's so fortunate, right? Yeah. Wow. So criminology. And I think it makes sense, actually, because it 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 is still crime, right? It's just not the like the other types of crime, like murders and stuff like exactly that. Exactly. It's a form of crime, right? Exactly that. And yeah. to be honest, that was so when I was doing my degree, I halfway through my degree, I was depressed because I was like, I can't even deal with doing these like modules because a lot of yeah. them were very heavy, like yeah. gender violence and all this type yeah. of stuff. And you're thinking, how can I do a job like that? If my degree is making me feel sad, how can yeah. I do a job like in this field? Yeah. And then when I discovered fraud and white collar crime, I was like, oh, okay, this is, don't get me wrong. Like there's so many layers to financial crime that are mm -hmm. still just as sad and just as bad. Yeah. Like if you look at things like human trafficking, et cetera, there's a lot yeah. of layers to peel back. But I felt like, okay, I think I can handle this. Like yeah. mentally, I think I can handle this more That's crazy. than like some of the other stuff. That's crazy. You know what I liked about that, that the part about the fact that you had a job mm already so i feel like you kind of you're a bit ahead because a lot of people when they finish you needed obviously going into like grad schemes and stuff like that yeah. that's what they're looking at but you already had something yeah that you could pivot into that you could like leverage to kickstart your career that's a good way to do it actually yeah that's a really good way actually yeah yeah it definitely definitely helped More me i think it did it way. did give me a bit of a head start into financial services i would yeah. say because at the time i think a lot of people probably looked at working in a bank as more of a customer service role because that was yeah. what my role effectively was i was yeah. a customer service agent i was you know like at the front of the like counter dealing with customers mm. but then i also started doing a lot of service control stuff and more risk risk things behind the scenes as well okay. so i wasn't sure what i wanted to do like growing yeah. my career wise at the bank but I, I do think that having that exposure to f like a basic understanding of financial mm. services really did help me. Okay, wow, that's amazing. So then how do we get to where you, okay, wh what are you doing now currently actually? So if, now um, yeah. I um, I head up a financial crime department. Okay. So my department cool. looks after like onboarding and KYC mm -hmm. and fraud and AML and ongoing due diligence. Cool. So how did you get there from the financial ombudsman to where you are now? Yeah. Okay. How did that happen? <laughs> <laughs> So um, I, so after the financial ombudsman service, like I said, I was like, I'd, after that point, I'd solidified that I really mm. wanted to work in, like a fraud role or yeah. look into a fraud role, but I was really struggling to break into it. Mm. I was really struggling to find an entry level position. Okay. And, so you're um, trying to look for entry level. Yeah. Yeah. So I was trying to find oh, like okay. fraud investigator type yeah. jobs, but everyone was asking for experience. Mm. And then I was like almost close to giving up at this point. Cause mm. I'd been at the financial ombudsman service for about two and a half years, I think at this mm -hmm. point. And um, a role came up at a payday lending company. Okay. And um, I remember at the time when they had reached out to me, I was even a bit like, I don't know if I really want to work here because they had a really bad reputation at the time mm -hmm. and a bad reputation at 
like the place I worked as well at the financial ombudsman service. They don't mm. weren't really the biggest fan of payday mm. lending. Yeah. So I was a bit like, do I really want to do this? Like, you know. Yeah. But then when I looked at the job description mm -hmm. and I thought about it and I was like, but this is exactly what I want to do. And if yeah. this is going to give me that step into the industry that I'm yeah. trying to break into, then I shouldn't really be turning up my nose at it. I should actually see where this might take yeah. me. And it was a fintech as well. Yeah. And I wanted to get into fintech, etc. Yeah. So that was my first opportunity. So I came in as like an entry level fraud I think my role was called fraud agent okay so i was a fraud, fraud agent. agent yeah Mad. um which essentially was just like a entry-level role just investigating the yeah. fraud cases that came in mm -hmm. and then um from there i sort of like worked my way around mm -hmm. um started doing a bit more like aml investigations mm -hmm. um doing more like proactive investigation and proactive yeah. monitoring then i ended up like training up a team so i ended yeah. up being like a team leader training okay. up a team hiring a team um, then I got to do a project in South Africa as well, mm -hmm. delivering some fraud training. Okay. So I feel like that role really yeah. solidified my career. I think that's where my that's career started to take off. Yeah. So as much as at the time I was looking at it, almost turning my nose up at it, like, oh, yeah. I don't think this is going to be that great. It actually turned out to be the best decision ever. So okay. sometimes that can, I would say like sometimes you think things are packaged. Don't always mm -hmm. look at how things are packaged. Like look mm -hmm. at like the, the granularity and like peel back yeah. the layers of it because you just never know. Yeah. Because that was honestly the pinnacle of my career, I would say. Because wow. from then, yeah. I think that all of the skills that I learned then and everything I got exposed mm -hmm. to then helped me get like the next role. So after that, right. I got a fraud manager role okay. and I was working for a tech company. Um, and even though I wasn't managing people, but mm. I was responsible for the function. Okay. And then from there, I then moved into another role, which was like a startup um, company mm. and they needed someone to come in and essentially build out the financial crime department. Yeah. So there was no, there was nothing. There was no processes. Mm. There was no people. Okay. So I kind of had to come in and help with that. And then from there, I then moved on to another fraud role, mm. um, another role managing a department. Mm -hmm. And then that was when I got promoted to head of at that company okay and then from then that's when i'm now here okay wow yeah that's crazy wow that's in, insane that's insane progression and how many years did you do all of this in do you know yeah so yeah. i started at the payday lending company in 2015 or 2016 oh i think so it like was eight years that's fast and then um and then I, yeah, so I was there and then I moved up to team yeah. leader there. Then the manager role was in 2018. Yeah. And then 2019 was the yeah. startup company. And then 2020 was when I got the role of managing the department and then got promoted to head of. Wow. So that's amazing. That was in total, I would say about five years. Wow. For, to get to the head of yeah. Um, level. Yeah. That's quick. Kind of, yeah. Yeah, yeah. that's very quick. I, I've got a few more questions anyway that I'm going to ask you, but I just want to sidetrack quickly. When, when uh, from a company's point of view, when they're doing like the anti-money laundering, like AML checks that you mentioned, can you just, can you um, talk to us about that? What, what What's the reasons for companies doing that? What are they trying to prevent? And yeah, generally speaking. So I think the main reason is it's a regulatory expectation. They okay. don't really have a choice. Okay. So I think cool. to be able to operate in um, financial services, mm -hmm. like you have to have a minimum level of due diligence yeah. that you're doing on your customers. So from that perspective, they've got regulatory obligations that they need to meet. They yeah. have to do these checks. They need to be conf confident and comfortable that the people that they are doing business with yeah. are not money launderers. They're yeah. not fraudsters. They're not terrorist finances. Finances, sorry. And so that's the main reason why. Okay. But also um, just to, I guess, like make sure that they've got a good understanding of their customer base yeah. so that's why they'll do a lot of those know your customer mm -hmm. checks like you know like what do you do for a living like yeah. show us your proof of like source of funds and source of wealth and all okay. these type of things but it's like so that as a business they can be comfortable with the people that they're doing business with and yeah. also to like um look after their risk appetite so all companies will have an appetite of risk when it comes to certain types of customers that they do yeah. business with and they just need to have a good way of managing that yeah. so yeah, there's there's loads of reasons, but yeah. the main one, if I'm being Those honest, the is they have to. <laughs> they have to. Okay, yeah. okay, cool. I hear it. So I was wondering this, right? So obviously, financial services is male dominated. We 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 know that. Um. So why why do you think that you've been successful in your career? Because obviously you've excelled. So why do you Thank think you. you've been successful? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, I think it's a combination of things. I think mm. that one, I one thing that I won't shy away from is I think opportunity so I was like quite fortunate that there were opportunities that came up and I was in the right position for them if that makes sense so sometimes it's about preparing for opportunities before they even come yeah. sometimes I think we get focused on that linear progression and we yeah. think oh like I want to do this next and I need to do that mm -hmm. but almost 
already prepare yourself for that and yeah. like already start like emulating some of those qualities and things that that role needs yeah. so that when it does come up you're the first person they're going to think of yeah. and that's exactly kind of what happened to me so when I was at the payday lending company before I was even like a team leader I was mm -hmm. already like helping like staff members I was yeah. helping some more junior staff that came in I was training up people every time they okay. joined the team I would be the one training them wow. I was proactively suggesting process mm -hmm. improvements and things so before I was even given a title I was mm -hmm. already like emulating those things okay and then um same thing like when I became head of the department was already so big and I was mm. managing it all anyway. So mm. I was already demonstrating that where well, you're already okay. running the department. Yeah. Like you might not officially have the title yet, mm. but you already like you, okay. you already run in the department. So mm. when it, when the opportunity came up, mm -hmm. the, it was just like almost like a no brainer for them. It yeah. was like, Oh yeah, well yeah, you're already heading it up. So here you go. It was kind of like that. Okay. And then actually to get that role before I came into um, that particular company, the person that was heading up the department before I'd worked with them at the payday lending company. Oh, okay. So already like four years prior, yeah. I'd already worked with them and they remembered right. me from then. So okay. again, it's about the relationships you build too yeah. and never burning bridges. I mean, yeah. that person worked with me all those years ago and she yeah. remembered like my work ethic back then. She remembered. Mm -hmm. And then she thought when the manager role came up, she said, oh yeah, sure, I think you'd be perfect for this. Yeah. So I feel like that wow. has also contributed to that. Like, opportunities coming up and me being in a position to receive those opportunities yeah. as well um and yeah and my network as well I think yeah. has has helped with that um I also think that like I'm not gonna lie I take up space <laughs> <laughs> I don't um I don't feel like I have ever shied away from my potential mm. in a way like don't get me wrong I battle with imposter syndrome mm -hmm. so I don't want to sit here on this podcast mm -hmm. and act like I have it all figured yeah. out because that would be an absolute yeah. lie I have many moments where I'm mm. not sure of myself or I'm doubting myself or I'm wondering mm -hmm. but I feel that whenever there's opportunities to I suppose demonstrate my potential I don't shy away from it yeah. so I feel like if not me, then then why not me? Like yeah. who else? So like that's Facts. kind of always been my attitude. And if yeah. other people can do it, then why can't I? They yeah. don't have two heads. So. Wow. That's amazing. <laughs> that's amazing. I love that. Actually, you mentioned a few things that I wanted to touch on. You mentioned your network. Talk about that and the, the importance of it and how yeah. you you built up your network. Um, so one was LinkedIn. Yeah. So LinkedIn is like one of the biggest, I would say, catalysts for my career. Every job I've ever gotten, bar one, I've never applied for. Okay. Like I've always been headhunted. I've oh, always been reached wow. out to on LinkedIn. I've never wow. applied. I don't even remember the last time I, like I've sent like actually filled out a job application. That's crazy. I've not done that in years, if I'm being honest. But I think LinkedIn has been a great tool for that and building up that network on LinkedIn. Even people that you don't know, recruiters, yeah. people in your industry, like they they'll follow you. They'll see your progression. They'll see like. And, you know, I've done things like going on like panels and stuff yeah. and stuff like that. And other people in your network, they see these things. So when opportunities come up, they think of you. So mm -hmm. even if they don't know you directly there, you can build up these like virtual yeah. networks as well, where people recognize you, they recognize what you do and they try to bring you into opportunities. Yeah. So I would say your network is very, very key, okay. um, especially when you're thinking about progressing and your network doesn't have to stop within just yeah. where you work. It can be like outside of your workplace, mm -hmm. other people in similar roles, yeah. try and connect with people as well that do the similar jobs to you. Yeah, and ask that's them a good one. Actually. What challenges yeah. are they facing? What are yeah. they seeing? Because you might learn loads of things from them. Yeah. Like I'm part of a fintech financial crime network okay. and like they're regularly sharing like yeah. typologies and ideas mm. and best practice, things okay. like that. That's a good one. And yeah. you build up those relationships that way, even if you're not even meeting these people. Yeah. So yeah, I feel like as well, just like sharing knowledge as well, I think mm -hmm. is important. Sharing knowledge, helping other people. Cause I don't feel like success is just for you. I yeah, feel like it's, it's to be, to I be believe shared. In that too. So yeah. yeah, I would say there's, yeah. I think having a solid network is important. Okay. On the flip side though, everything went, it went good, succeeded. But what were the challenges that you faced through through your journey? Oh, there's loads. Yeah. <laughs> there was definitely, definitely loads. I wouldn't sit here and say that it was smooth sailing. Mm -hmm. um, I would say, I think that the, I think the first challenge was, um, so one of the places I worked, so when I said I left the payday lending company and I went yeah. to the tech company, I had so much fun working there. Like it was like a playground, yeah. <laughs> literally. Like the office environment was great. I was getting massages at my desk. What? I was getting my nails done every two weeks. What? There was a hairdresser's on oh site. There was free food. Like they did everything they could to make wow. you happy as staff and make your working environment so good. They literally had people like, it was their job to make you happy. Mm. So they would come up to you like every week and be like, hey, like, what do you, are you happy? Like, what do you need? Oh One time God. I was like, I want super malt. And they were like, okay. Next day there was super malt in the fridge. Like they, that was literally their job just to make what? you so happy. 
crazy. And I'd never worked anywhere like that where there was yeah. just such a strong emphasis on just like making the actual working environment yeah. so fun. However, the role, so the actual role itself mm -hmm. was really derailing me from mm -hmm. where I needed to get to. So mm -hmm. I was kind of faced with this battle of, this is fun, I'm getting paid well, I enjoy working here, enjoy the people. I actually kind of have it quite easy. Mm -hmm. But when I'm thinking about my career and the direction I want to go to, this role is not going to get me any closer to that mm -hmm. because there wasn't really any fraud for yeah. me to manage. So as much as I was a fraud manager, there was really not that much fraud. Okay. And it wasn't, it wasn't like the fraud I was used to coming from mm. like more of a financial services background because yeah. this was a tech company. So I had to kind of ask myself, okay, you're having fun here, <laughs> but <laughs> like what, like in the long term, like what do you want? And for yeah. me, it was to try to grow my career. So I was, I felt like I was in a bit of a rock and a hard place. So yeah. what do I do? Like, I've got it good here. Do I stay or do I move on? I moved on in the end. I was mm. there for like about a year, I think. And okay. then I took the leap. But I genuinely think if I didn't do that, I would not be where I am now. Really? Um, no, because I wouldn't have built up the experience yeah. and the exposure I would have needed yeah. to get to a level where I would have had the experience to be able to head yeah. up a department. Yeah. I wouldn't have been able to do that. So I think, yeah, that was definitely one challenge because sometimes I think you can be faced with a bit of conflicting decisions along mm -hmm. your career journey and you're never sure which is the right decision to make. Yeah. And that can be quite hard. So I think that was definitely one for me. I think another challenge as well was around the time when I got promoted to the head of role, um, my, so I'd gotten a new boss mm -hmm. and um, he also had been promoted. Okay. But it was, it was a bit of a strange setup in that our job titles seemed similar. Okay. Even though he was effectively my boss yeah. and I was the head of financial crime. Mm -hmm. And it was like our job titles were a bit similar and it was yeah. a bit confusing, et cetera. So for me, it was like, I found that like difficult to navigate in terms of, well, I don't see any other head of department that necessarily has to share this title. Because yeah. that's what it felt like at the time. Okay. That wasn't the case really on paper, yeah. but the optics for me mm. was like important. You sit there and you think to yourself, this sounds so petty. Yeah. It sounds like such a childish <laughs> thing, but like it's it's bothering me because yeah. I feel that, you know, I've worked hard to get to this point. Why yeah. should I feel like I have to share that? Yeah. No one else has to. Yeah. So I think that was, again, um, my first time of having to navigate a bit of a awkward mm -hmm. situation with senior leadership and yeah. like, how do you voice that and what gets done about it, et cetera. Yeah. So, yeah. I've definitely had like quite a few, a few challenges along the way. Yeah. Um, and even just like, even coming to this role, um, it was new for me. First time I'd like joined anywhere remotely, like mm. fully remote. Um, Is it fully remote? Yeah. No. yeah. Now it's fully yeah, remote. Yeah, it's fully it's remote. still fully remote? Yeah. Oh. You can come into the office like whenever you want. Oh, okay. But it's not like you have to come you into have the to office X in. amount of times. And it's the first wow. time I'd ever joined a company remotely where I've not met my colleagues physically. Ah. So I didn't meet a lot of my colleagues for months. So that okay. was like, a bit yeah, I had different. the same challenge as well. Yeah. yeah, I found that a bit difficult, particularly yeah. when you're like leading a whole department. Mm -hmm. I found it difficult to like navigate that virtually yeah. in terms of building those relationships, I would say. Yeah. Um, and then adjusting to a new culture because I'm working for a bank now, whereas I've yeah. never worked for a bank before. Mm -hmm. So I think that adjustment of facing the fact that a lot of what you consider to be your strengths mm -hmm. in terms of what how you are and what you do might not be applicable everywhere. Mm -hmm. So the things that I felt that I was like really good at, and these were like my key strengths, and these were the things I could really drive in my previous job. Yeah. Coming to this job, I had to almost think of new strengths because it was like, okay. they weren't as applicable here yeah. because they do things very differently. Here. Yeah. So yeah. I think it was like trying to navigate that. And yeah, I definitely would say that was a challenge. How did you, how did you overcome the virtual stuff? Cause I haven't spoken about that either yet. And I, I also, I got interviewed during it was still lockdown I got it Same, all my yeah. interviews were locked down I think my first week I actually yeah I did meet one of my my colleagues but it was like only three people in the office how did how did you navigate that since you were managing the team um I just really tried hard to try to mm. build relationships with people as yeah. much as possible um whether that meant having like more calls than usual yeah. or just really not being afraid to ask for help if I needed it, yeah. that sort of thing. Um, and I really just tried to just be very humble. I didn't mm -hmm. come in on this vibe of, well, I'm the head of department, you mm -hmm. do what I say. Like, yeah. It was very much like- look, <laughs> Tyranny, right? <laughs> yeah, I, I was never gonna do that. I very much wanted to come on this tip of, yeah. okay, yes, I'm the head of department, but I'm still, I have a lot to learn. Yeah. So understand that I'm really kind of at you guys' mercy, really. Yeah. So I need you to help me so I can help you. Yeah, It was yeah. more like that. Cool. Another area I haven't spoken a lot about is managing people. <laughs> <laughs> and leadership well yeah. no we've spoken about leadership i've spoken about leadership that's a what that's that's a lie i have spoken about leadership it was a long time ago mm. but managing people we haven't really delved into that right how do you find that how do you how do you find managing people i'm i find it 
I find it fine. Yeah. I, I think it's good for me, but I yeah. think it's, I'm a people person. So okay. I like engaging with people. Yeah. And I, you know, a lot of the stuff I do with like my YouTube channel and Instagram yeah. and stuff, it's a lot of like coaching and okay. like giving people career guidance and stuff. Mm. So to me, that stuff comes quite easy. Yeah. So I enjoy that. Yeah. Um, but there are definitely a lot of challenges to managing yeah. people. It's not for everyone. Yeah. What, what would you say to somebody? Because some people are, you know, when they're first, when they first start to manage somebody obviously there's a lot that you can learn what 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 tips would you give to somebody you know in terms of getting the best out of somebody and i guess building that relationship where it works for both of you yeah i'd say like be yourself but understand that management is not a one size fits all approach mm -hmm. you have to really adapt your management style yeah. to each person that you're managing because you might have someone that they're a bit more independent and they don't really need that much coaching and guidance from you. They're able to just get on with it. They just want to have one-to-ones with you, talk about their development, et cetera. But they're very much like they work quite autonomously. Yeah. But then you have people that need that additional support, that additional coaching and guidance. And it's been able to identify what, what each person needs from you yeah. and not being afraid to ask for feedback either. Yeah. I think that's something that I would say, actually, going back to challenges, when I first started managing, I was say afraid to ask for feedback but i wouldn't always directly yeah. ask people okay what can i do differently what can yeah. i do better but it's almost like if you don't ask how are you going to know how to yeah. like improve and grow in your role and i think that yeah like if especially if you're new to managing just like put it out there and make sure that people know that they can be open and honest with you yeah. and encourage that open dialogue because yeah. once people feel like they are comfortable and they can be open with you I think it's fine. Yeah. Um, yeah. I agree with that. I agree with that. I I don't like to be micromanaged. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm I very in the, I think most people nowadays don't, right? We're, we're adults. What I think what we like is being coached, yeah. but not micromanaged. I think yeah. there's a difference. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that old style of management is gone. Nobody wants to be micromanaged. We want to be coached. We want to learn, but we also want to be able to just do things on our own and also sometimes figure it out, right? And just yeah. grow. Yeah. You know, I think there's a, there's a nice, there's, it's nice to be able to okay you know what i've got this task for a week let me figure out how to tackle it let me try and come at it with my own ideas and then maybe give me feedback on it but don't tell me okay you need to do step one to seven in exact <laughs> way i do it i just don't think it's i don't think that promotes real growth no. in a person because everybody does things in their own way exactly. i think what you need to figure out what i realize is as i uh became more experienced is actually i don't need to follow what like I, I can pick little bits here and there, but I just need to do it, figure what works for me in my style, in my personality. So that's what I kind of figured out. Um, question I actually had for you. Now that you're on the other side, right? Mm. Of like things like promotion, salary <laughs> reviews. In fact, no, the most important question I want to ask here, right? Because promotion, right, is such a, it's, it's different across many organizations. Some organizations have a very structured type of promotion got to do annual year reviews you've got to um, do this and that right regardless of any of these structures people do have i think what i've heard anyways people have that person in mind that they want to promote or people in mind that they want to pr promote right mm. is that true sitting on the other side <laughs> Always, you know, okay, not always. Cool. I think sometimes your hands can be tied in yeah. terms of what you can do. Because okay. even if you do have people in mind that you want to promote and yeah. you want to give pay rises to, sometimes you actually can't. Okay. Um, and I actually learned that a lot, like in the job I'm in currently, mm. actually, because they've got a very fixed structure to the way they do promotions and okay. the way they do pay reviews. Mm -hmm. Whereas I've come from a background where I, that was my decision. Like I yeah. had that autonomy. Like okay. if I wanted to promote someone, yeah. if I wanted to give someone a pay rise, I could, yeah. as long as I put a good enough like case together, yeah. I could make that happen. Okay. So again, that was a bit of a struggle for me coming mm -hmm. to this, the, this place and not really having that level of autonomy. Mm -hmm. So it's not always as clean cut as like people know who they want to promote. Yeah. I do think that there's definitely things that you look for when you're yeah. thinking about people that you want to promote and you want to give those opportunities to, mm -hmm. particularly if those opportunities are few and far between. Yeah. So for example, like in my workplace now, there's not a lot of room in terms of like, oh yes, you can just do this. This is, Sometimes it's like someone might have to leave for you mm. to get that opportunity. Yeah. Whereas other places, it's not really like that. Yeah. So I think it just depends. But I think there's probably qualities that you look for mm. or certain things that you're looking out for when you're thinking about, okay, I've got 10 direct reports, but I've only yeah. got one role. Yeah. There's going to be certain things that yeah. have to stick out for you to think, all right, out of these 10 people, which one deserves it the most? Mm. Like, there's going to be things that you're looking for, I would yeah. say. Um, but yeah, I don't think it's a simple yes or no answer to that one. Okay. I think it really, really depends. Cool. And what what are those things that that you 
I know it's it's specific to your situation, yeah. but I'm trying to you know what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to paint the picture for for people so they kind of understand maybe potentially what they have to do mm. to to get a bit of insight. Because although I've said that um, you know some organizations have a structured process, it's structured, but it's not really. Mm. So you think you've been told, oh yeah, this is what you need to do, but when it goes behind when when it goes to review it you know it goes up whatever i feel like it's not transparent mm, mm. you know i would I argue actually i haven't worked at many that's no that's not true one organization i worked at was they were very transparent in terms of okay if i had a career manager had a conversation with them and then they would they said we will either put you forward or not i really like that process okay, okay because then i knew okay i had a fighting chance right mm. it wasn't like okay atto wants to get promoted uh okay just silence you get what i mean it's like okay atto wants to get promoted and i'm gonna put him forward yeah we're gonna have a conversation because there it wasn't just me it would be like other people right mm -hmm. that had that conversation and then obviously they'll choose out of you know everybody makes their case and they choose and i thought that was a good process i'm like okay cool at least like you know, and he will tell me if he felt I was ready or not, right? Right. So, 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 so that was quite transparent. Whereas I've worked in other places where it wasn't so transparent. I've told them I want promotion, I want promotion, and I'm getting yeah. told, oh, you need to do this, you need to do that. Yeah. And then, and then, oh, you need to get a certain score. You get that score, and then nothing happens. You're like, well, actually, this is not transparent. This is not really transparent. How do I? How does it work, right? <laughs> so, um, yeah. So I guess what, 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 what things can people do to stand out i guess mm -hmm. in that in if they want to get promoted so i think the the first thing is to and i know this is going to sound really 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 basic mm -hmm. but it's to really understand the requirements of your role and make sure that you are delivering against those things okay because i think sometimes you can look so far forward yeah because you're thinking about the next level so you're yeah. thinking okay i need to do beyond my job yeah but are you actually doing your job right mm -hmm. <laughs> and are you actually like like hitting all of the objectives for yeah. your role and then like i think that's the first thing like yeah. are you hitting your objectives for what's required yeah. and if you don't have a clear understanding of what that is then that's the type of conversation you need to be having with your manager yeah. to be like well i don't even know what the what the measure of success is here how am i being measured like yeah. what are you measuring me on like yeah. what are my objectives what yeah. should i be doing on a day-to-day -day? and really take ownership of those conversations as well i think for me the things that stand out are people that actually take ownership of their mm. own progression they're not necessarily waiting to be told mm. oh yes you're ready for a promotion now or oh yes you need to be doing this they actually come to the one-to-ones already equipped to like mm. have that conversation with me to say right this quarter i did this 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 and this mm -hmm. and this is how i directly like contributed to the okrs for the business mm -hmm. this is how i've actually like improved things for the department yeah. this is how i've like supported others and they're able to demonstrate that to me without me even necessarily even having to drive that conversation yeah. they've taken full ownership of their own progression mm -hmm. for me i think that's how you stand out okay wow noted <laughs> <laughs> noted um you mentioned something else that i wanted to touch on actually it was kind of part of one of my questions um and it was it was around you, you mentioned um around opportunities and potentially sometimes people have to move move on for mm -hmm. that opportunity to open for you some as i guess some people have that di dilemma what what do you think about the whole thing about job hopping do you think that has an impact on I guess your career at all? Not really. Do you think it's you think it's something you should do? Hundred percent. I yeah. mean, I can only speak for some as someone yeah. that has clearly job yeah. hopped from what I've been saying. But no, I I don't believe in the myth of that. You yeah. know, if you move around too frequently, it's gonna affect your career. Obviously, I can't speak for every sector. Yeah. Maybe there are some sectors where mm. it's frowned upon if you move around too quickly. I don't yeah. know. But I feel like in the sort of fintech space, it's not unheard of if people move around quite quickly. Yeah. And like I said, like I kept getting poached. So for yeah. me, it was like the opportunities came, they made sense. So I moved forward. And if I'm being completely honest, that's how I was able to increase my salary. Okay. I don't think that I would have been able to see the salary increases that I did if I stayed in one place. And I think it is a bit of a shame that in yeah. this day and age, that is the best way to increase your salary is to yeah. jobs. Yeah. Um, it would be great if people could see like the same large nominations of increases mm -hmm. in their job. But I just, I don't know, I'm yet to work anywhere where I've had yeah. like a massive like 20, 30, 40k bump just yeah. in the same job. I've just not seen that. Yeah, yeah. I don't, it's almost impossible. Mm. Actually, this brings me on to di uh, a dilemma. Do you think it's better to try to negotiate your salary or just to move on? Do you think it's even worth 
worth doing that. I think it depends on what your salary structure is like. Yeah. Because I think there's certain, because each role, and this is something that I discovered when I became mm. a manager, every role has a budget. So mm. there's a budget for like a max that the company is willing to pay for that yeah. role. And depending on what your salary structure is, you might say, if you know, for example, that within the budget for your role, you've still got, I don't know, like 10, 15, 20K that you could potentially go up in, then yeah, there probably is scope to try to negotiate mm. if you know that there is a max that you can still get. Yeah. But I do think that in some roles, it's very, very rigid. Mm. And it might be that there's only a max that you could get to within that role. And yeah. in order for you to get more money, you'd have to move to a different role in yeah. a different salary band. And maybe that's not so easy to do. So that might be when you say, okay, I might as well move on to somewhere else yeah. if I'm not able to do that. So I think it really depends on what your salary structure is. If yeah. you've got a really rigid salary structure, mm. then there's it might not feel like it's worth negotiating because you might think, okay, the increase I'm even after, I'm not going to get anyway because yeah. I'm I'm limited by this salary band in. Yeah. Let me go somewhere else. Yeah. Or you might say, actually, the salary band is quite wide, so there is an opportunity here mm. to try to negotiate. So yeah, yeah I, I I think just really depends on that structure. How, how do you know how people can find out that? For me, I ask people, so that's you know that's me. But is there? Do you think there's another way, or do you think? People should just ask. I think their, you should just ask. Their ask, yeah. yeah. Ask their managers ask. and stuff like that. And if your yeah, manager also. doesn't know, your manager should find out. Yeah. Um, okay. Because, That's interesting. Like when you're hiring, because yeah. this, this was like, again, like when I started managing and I started hiring people, mm. that's when I was like, oh, you actually have budget for roles. I don't know why I just thought that people would just pull numbers yeah, out. Not, like, but they don't say it. Yeah, they don't. Know? So the like purpose, when you're, of course. yeah, when you're going for yeah. roles and then you say, like, let's say you say you want 40K yeah. and then they might say, oh yeah, like we can, we can do that. You don't know that maybe the band for that role was even like up to 60K. <laughs> so you don't even know that you've like yeah. lobeled yourself so yeah. much because they've just been like, oh yeah, 40K. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. We can do that. They might even try and sweet you up and give you 45. So you're thinking, yeah. oh my gosh, they've even given me more yeah. than what I asked for. Not knowing that you could have got like way more because the budget for the role was so okay. wide. That's so so sometimes it is good to get an understanding of like what the budget for roles are. Yeah, that, that will kind of drive some of those salary negotiations. Okay, that's... That is such a great tip, and I've never heard anybody talk about that. <laughs> yeah. That is that definitely is a great something tip. I, I discovered. Okay, so you think that when you're preparing for those... Oh, that was the other thing I was going to ask you. Salary negotiations, right, outside of annual reviews, is that something that you've had experience in mm -hmm. doing yourself, yeah? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, cool. I have. Um, and I've had my direct reports, for example, yeah. like in previous roles, come to me yeah. and talk to me about salary um, negotiations outside of different pay cycles, mm -hmm. etc. Um, I I think it really depends, I guess, the reason yeah. as to why you're you're asking for that mm. particular pay rise. If you feel that you are not being paid the market rate for that mm -hmm. role, then that's definitely a driver to yeah. like lead with. And for me, that's been the case. So when I like had that um, conversation. I was looking at what other people were being paid in the industry for the same job. Yeah. And I was like, no, nah, this ain't it. <laughs> so, uh, and then, and Ooh. I also had a bit of leverage at the time because yeah. I was the most experienced person. Um, all of the people that used to work in the team had either left or they mm. like um, didn't pass probation or things like that. Okay. So it was literally just me that had the most experience so at that time. They kind of, they did really need me. And I'm not going to lie. I did leverage that because okay. it was like, if I leave, yeah. who's going to train? Who's going to yeah. train these people? Like yeah. you've got new people that you're going to be hiring soon. Mm. Who, who's going to train them? My manager couldn't have trained them at the time. Mm. He wasn't familiar with the process enough. Yeah. Um, there was no one else in within wow. the financial crime area that could actually do that. So for me, it was like a bit of leverage of, right, okay, I am the most experienced person on the yeah. team. I am actually getting interest from other companies, which was true. I, I didn't make that up. So I did actually yeah. like go out and I was actually interviewing with yeah. other companies. And I remember getting a job offer at the time as well. Okay. But I really wanted to stay where I was. Yeah. So I did sort of say, look, I've got this job offer. This is how much they're willing to pay me for the same job. Yeah. What can you guys do? Okay. <laughs> so that's it. That you have to have your leverage. You have to, right? Yeah. Because otherwise, like you said, they're going to ask you, well, why? Right? Yeah. Exactly. And then you can't be like, um, 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 because I need to pay for my wedding. Because it's, yeah, okay, everybody needs to pay for something, right? So, like you said, you've got your your leverage, right? Yeah. Yeah, I'm the most experienced here. I'm basically irre irreplaceable too. Yeah. Other companies want me. Yeah. That's important. Look, I could get poached right now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, wow, that's that's great. That's great. Yeah. Um, and if I guess, I guess, how how did you? I guess what I'm trying to find out, right? Obviously, I, I, I love the approach that you took. Um, for 
for people that don't have necessarily the irreplaceable leverage, mm. but they have, do you think they should still do the whole applying tactic to have that leverage? Do you think that's something that they should do? In to, terms to of like applying that? for another job? Yeah. yeah. Cause yeah. I, and it's, it's sad that people f- like have to do that. Yeah, But is, I yeah. have found that companies are a lot more receptive to discussing salary when they know that you're about to leave. Yeah. And I don't know why. <laughs> Honestly, crazy. I don't know why. It's crazy. Um, I'm yet to crack the code of why this yeah. is. But in some companies, it's like if you come and you say, all right, and particularly if they value you as an employee yeah. and you come and you say, I've got another job offer, they're paying this. That's when all of a sudden this budget that they didn't have before will now come and they can <laughs> afford to somehow keep you. Sometimes they might be honest and say, no, we can't match it. Yeah. But I think if they really want to keep you, they will try, even if they like can't match it exactly, but to try yeah. and get close to it, et cetera. Um, and it should never get to that. Because it should never, it should get, never that. get to yeah. the point where someone's already almost out the door before yeah. you now want to actually like show that you value them. And I yeah. think that's such a like mistake that companies make. Yeah, it's it's I I never get it. I I mean, my last company I uh, I left. Oh yeah, we're looking at promotion for you. Did, look, I, at that point, I'm 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 done. Yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. finished. It was the like, same as me. I think I remember like leaving a company and it was like, yeah. oh yeah, we were like just about to give you this, and I'm like. But you didn't even, when, when did this discussion happen? You yeah. didn't say, like, let me know that, oh, yeah. this was coming down the pipeline. Yeah. It's now that I'm now moving on. You now want to tell me. It's too late now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I don't, I don't appreciate that. And I'm like, yeah, you're just gonna, you're just gonna not appreciate me again yeah. in the future, right? I don't, yeah, I don't really uh, like stuff like that. So, yeah. So you bought a property recently. Talk to us about that. Oh, yeah. Oh, gosh. Time has flown now, though. It's, been, yeah. it's coming up to two years. It'll be Is it? Years two years? Oh, mad. <laughs> I think I remember like... when you announced it on socials, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. but it feels, it feels like closer. But, yeah, it was like 2021, yeah. Wow. Yeah, June 2021. That's crazy. And um, so, from what I remember, you use Right to Buy. Mm-hmm. Is that correct for yeah. it? Right? Can you explain what is Right to Buy? Yeah, so Right to Buy is a, um, I don't know if it's a scheme, but it's basically um, an option that the government have where you can buy your ex-council property at a discounted rate. So they will give you a discount off the market value, which, and then you can then buy it for whatever the the equivalent is. So like to to put it into context, for example, the market value for my property at the time was that's another thing. I think the council do undervalue, which isn't a bad thing, by the way. Mm-hmm. But um, they valued it at three ninety, mm-hmm. and then they gave me a discount of one hundred and thirteen k. I think. Oh. So um, my my that's total crazy. purchase price, I think, was two seven seven. Oh. So yeah, just to give like context to some of the numbers, but yeah, essentially, like if you're eligible, um, and if the if the property is eligible to be bought, mm-hmm. then yeah, you have the option of of buying it at a discounted rate. That's crazy. Why why did you decide to to go down that route, and why did you decide to buy a council flat? So um, I was already living in it. Okay. So I um like moved out of my mum's house mm. in 2017 I think it was yeah. so I didn't know much about like the council like right to buy I okay. was just like on the council list anyway yeah um and then when the opportunity came up I was like great but I did start having to think about like if I was gonna buy this in the future mm-hmm. I wanted to think about okay what areas would make sense yeah in terms of like profitability if I'm being honest in yeah. terms of future investments yeah. etc um and then like my location is quite central mm-hmm. um, just because of the borough that I was in. You have places that are in certain central locations. So yeah. I did have that in the back of my mind, but I wasn't sure if 100% that was the route I was going to go down. Yeah. But I wanted to make sure that I made a good choice just yeah. in case I did later decide. Mm-hmm. And I think what solidified it for me was the opportunity, I guess, to to buy the property for less than what it was worth. Because yeah. if it wasn't for that, there's no way like on a normal just like on a normal day, I don't think I would have been able to have got mm. the property that I got for the price that I yeah. got it in the location that I got it yeah. in. So I was really thinking about the future investment. So even though I had the op- option of just buying another property on the open market, yeah. I thought for my first time buy to, to just like take like advantage yeah. of that opportunity that I had. Okay. Amazing. What are the pros though and cons of buying a, a council property? Oh, there's loads. <laughs> yeah. um, I yeah. would say a pro is like probably what I've just talked about in terms of the discount that you get. Yeah. Also, you do have the option as well. If you're, as long as your earnings are enough and you, um, you're able to meet the affordability criteria, mm-hmm. you can actually use that discount as your deposit. Okay. So effectively you could 
buy it without actually putting any of the oh. money into it. Well, you still have to pay for things like yeah. solicitors fees. You yeah. still have to pay for um, anything else, like the other costs that are associated with buying a property. Yeah. But you could just effectively, the bank will recognize that as yeah. your deposit. So that 113K, yeah. they see that as the equity that's in the property. Okay. You can use that as your deposit. So that's one pro. Mm. So for example, if you've saved up money, like let's say you've saved up your money for yeah. your deposit, you could use that money for something else. You okay. could use that money maybe to make improvements to the property. You could use it to buy another property. Mm -hmm. You could use it for other stuff. So yeah. that's definitely a pro there. Okay. Um, also, I think for me, another pro was um, like the location. Yeah. So like getting a property in a decent location um, was good. Not being too far from my mom's, yeah. that sort of thing. So a lot of the challenges that I think people face when they're buying property around yeah. location, I didn't really have that. Yeah, so London especially. Was, yeah, exactly. So I think that was a definite pro. Um, I think the cons, there's quite a few. <laughs> okay. So just thinking about some of the cons. Um, so there's something called major works. Mm -hmm. So um, essentially if the council decide that they're gonna fix something or they're yeah. gonna add something or they're gonna make improvements to the building, you as the leaseholder will have to pay towards that. Okay. And it can be thousands and yeah. thousands of pounds. So wow. at the time when I was buying it, they originally estimated that the major works over the next five years for me that I would have to contribute mm -hmm. to would be 13,000. When it got to the time of completion, it was zero. I mean, I wasn't okay. complaining, <laughs> but obviously in the back okay, of my mind, it's good. like they're basically saying that at completion, I have to pay 13K. Yeah. I didn't have to do that in the end, thankfully. However, wow. recently they have been doing some of these work. So they fixed the car park. Mm. They did all these things. And then, yeah, they sent me a bill. So I think it was 1,005 that I had okay. to pay, which isn't too okay, bad. It's not bad, yeah. But for some people, it can be thousands. So like I know, for example, there's people who have like, if you've got, like I don't have a lift in my building. Mm. It's quite a small building. But people who have lifts, mm. lift maintenance, if the lift breaks down and stuff, yeah. they have to contribute towards that. Wow. If they now say they want to do double glazing, yeah. they have to contribute towards that. So That's crazy. it's been really conscious of the cost that might come after that yeah. because you 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 have to pay it. Mm -hmm. um, they might give you payment plans and stuff. Yeah. But, so yeah, so major work, service charge, you have mm. to pay. Um, I'd say that is a con because like, you know, people might just look at it as like, oh, this is great. You get a discount. Yeah. Fantastic. But think about what costs might come and make sure that you're financially equipped for that. Yeah. So I think there's that. The other con I think I would say as well is um, I didn't get that new home feeling because mm -hmm. I was already living in it. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, like okay. when you buy a house and yeah. you get your keys and you yeah. move into your property, I didn't okay. get any of that. Okay. So I Fair still enough. sometimes, sometimes it's only when people remind me, I'm like, yeah. oh yeah, I do. I am a homeowner. But yeah. sometimes I like genuinely forget that. Okay. So there is that. I mean, that might not be a big thing to some people, yeah. but for me, it was like, it was a great achievement, don't get me mean, wrong. Yeah. And I was happy, Yeah. but I was already living there. <laughs> so yeah, it was like, mean, yeah. it didn't really feel like, you know, okay, I've just got a new place. Okay. Um, so that's a good, say, interesting point, actually. Yeah. So that's something to to bear in mind yeah. as well, because it is the place that you're living that you have to buy. Yeah. So it's not like you can buy like another council property. You yeah. have to buy the one that you're living in. Oh, gosh. Yeah. <laughs> um, that that is, in, that is a very, very interesting point, actually. Um, I think a lot of people do like the new home. <laughs> owner feeling yeah so yeah, for me yeah. when i buy like my next property for me yeah. that will be like my yeah. almost like my first time yeah your first one <laughs> i was already living there um so yeah i definitely say that that was that was a con that's crazy um so you also have a business on the side can you talk to us about that a little bit about that yeah so um it's like wedding planning and coordination and, yeah. well event planning and coordination i would yeah. say so not just like weddings but i would say weddings is predominantly like the space that i've been in okay um so yeah so um anything from full planning to partial planning to yeah. just like on the day coordination um that's pretty much what i what i specialize in what was the motivation i mean you're doing good in your career what was the motivation to be like yeah i'm gonna start a wedding um planning business i i kind of fell into it to be honest like one of my friends was like do you want to plan my wedding <laughs> i kind of ah, fell into it because i was okay. always that natural event planner like yeah. where other people found event planning stressful yeah. i enjoyed it okay so i would always be like the default person if there yeah. was an event or something people would always ask me to help mm -hmm. and i didn't realize it was something that was actually a business yeah. until i started doing it and then okay. i was like oh no this is actually people are doing this as a business like wow. i could do this so that's sort of where it started wow and how how are you balancing this with a demanding job that you have like how am i balancing it i think being really organized okay i'm not always organized don't okay. don't get me wrong yeah. but I have to have a structure to like how I plan my weeks. Okay. Um, so I have to have different days for different things. Mm -hmm. So there might be a day that's dedicated to just like solely wedding stuff. Okay. 
and there might be a day dedicated to solely like content creation or okay. there might be a day solely just to be like, okay, you just need to think about doing stuff for work. Mm -hmm. I try to like separate things as well because what I wasn't good at before, what mm -hmm. I feel like I didn't do a great job of before was like, I'd think about everything at once. Yeah. So I'd be at work thinking about weddings mm -hmm. um, or I'd be like spending my evenings thinking about work or mm -hmm. like I didn't have like a good like structure to how I was thinking about things. Yeah. So what I said to myself was, when you're in a particular thing, you need to focus on that. Yeah. So when I'm at work, work is the focus. Okay. I can't be thinking about weddings and stuff. Yeah. So I started to implement a better way of managing my time. So okay. even when it came to like responding to clients, things like that, like I'd do that at set times of the yeah. day. I always try and be as responsive as I can, mm -hmm. but I'd more dedicate focus like at different times of the day so okay. that it wasn't like eating into like my work, my yeah. work. So yeah, I think it's just about having like dedicated times for things, not overexerting yourself as well. So for mm -hmm. example, I'll only do a certain amount of weddings a year. I'll okay. never do beyond that because okay. of the fact that I've got such a demanding day job. Okay. I'm not gonna now come and say, I'm gonna be doing like 10 weddings in a month and stuff yeah. like that. I never do back-to-back -back wedding bookings either. So I'll mm -hmm. never do like more than one wedding in a month. I'll okay. never do like a wedding on a Friday and then a wedding on a Saturday. Mm -hmm. I have no idea how wedding planners do that. Yeah. Even the ones that do wedding planning full time, yeah. I have no idea how they do wow. it. Wow. Um, because there's so much that goes into that. Yeah day for you to like then do another do the same thing again the next mm -hmm. day i just could never I yeah do it that's so it's crazy. stuff like that just like being really strict about yeah. like how i'm balancing it all i think has helped i like that tip that's a really 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 good tip because i think there's a something there's a term that they use um in technology i don't think it's a technology term but it's something i've heard context switching mm -hmm. and i think it takes a lot of energy to um, just to explain it, like do you're doing one thing, you're focused on one thing, then you have to go and do another thing and yeah. rethink. Okay, where did where did I last stop and what was I doing? So yeah, I, I like the whole fact of okay, just focus on this today and then I'll focus on this uh, the next day. That 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 makes sense. So yeah. do you feel like you ever go full time with it, or are you just gonna keep it as a side hustle no, for yourself? Yeah. No, I don't think weddings is something that I would want to do full time. Okay. Um, it's always been like my little side baby. Okay. Um, but I think that's because there's so many other things that I really want to do or okay. still need to do. So I don't. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think weddings are something I'll do full time. Okay. Amazing. Amazing. And what, what are those things that you're planning to do? I have to watch this space. You have to watch this space. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Cool. I like that. I like that. Amazing. Amazing. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Shay. Um, what, what, what do you have planned next for yourself? Um, to be honest, I am really prioritizing self care at the moment. Okay, um, cool. I think, like as we've we've mentioned, there's like lots of plates spinning. Yeah. And sometimes I think I'm not as consistent with just okay. prioritizing myself yeah. within everything I need to do. Mm -hmm. So I think for me, it's really about just getting a better balance on self care. Really okay. like pouring back into myself. Um, at the moment, I'm also studying, so I'm doing a diploma for work. So are you? Wow. Yeah. So Gosh. I'm just like trying to make sure that I've got like a good balance and just like yeah. remembering to prioritize myself along the way. Wow. Yeah. Keep at it. Keep at it. And yeah, it's very important. One health. I mean, I, I posted an episode today talking about health. You only have it once. Right. Exactly. Right. Health before wealth. 100%. For sure. 100%. There's the most not important taking any thing. of these things with you. Yeah, definitely. Um, so where, where can people find you? Yeah. So um, I'm on Instagram, um, Slay with Shay UK, YouTube, Slay with Shay UK. I have a Twitter, but I'm not going to lie. I don't really use it. Yeah. So there's probably no point following me on there. <laughs> but yeah, Slay with Shay UK on all platforms. Um, my wedding business is Events by Shay UK. So um, I'm on Instagram as Events by Shay UK. And my website will be coming soon. Amazing, 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 amazing. Um, no, it's been a great conversation. You've done so well in such Thank a short you. amount of time. So make sure to keep it up. Keep sharing your wisdom. Keep sharing your career tips. I feel like I've learned a lot that I feel like I... I'll be able to um, um, implement, especially the leverage stuff. Like I've never really thought about like, you know, if I'm going into like a salary negotiation or anything like that. And I had I had, I had a salary review recently. I never thought, oh, you know what? Let me just apply to a job or at least, you know, have something in the back pocket just to be mm -hmm. saying, look, this is what they're offering. What you, what you, yeah. what are you going to do? Right. Um, so, yeah, I think, I think that's, uh, I think it's very, very important. I think the message there is, you just gotta be prepared, right? You gotta be prepared at all times, right? Otherwise. Yeah, exactly. And I think it's just good as well just to know where you stand within yeah. the industry. Yeah. Because sometimes like when you work somewhere, you can get very tunnel vision yeah. and you think that that's the only thing and that that's the gospel way of doing things. Yeah. But it's only when you take a step out, see how other people are doing things that you're like, no, this isn't the only thing. Exactly. So there's actually loads of other options out there. So I yeah. think even just for that, it's good. Yeah. 
Amazing, amazing. Do you have any final words for the watchers and listeners? I think just don't be so, don't be too hard on yourself. I feel like this generation is so hard on themselves. And do you know what? As much as like I've spoken about a lot of the things I've done and a lot of the things I'm doing, I don't want anyone to like listen to this and feel that pressure that they need to mm. be doing so much. Because I do think we're in a society where people aren't just allowed to be still. It's almost yeah. like you've got to have this like really big mm. job. You've got to have a side hustle. You've got to do this. Mm -hmm. I'm here to tell you don't have to do any of those things. All yeah. you have to do is just be happy. That's it. Yeah. Be happy. You've got one life. Don't feel like you need to have so many plates spinning. And I know that might sound really hypocritical mm -hmm. coming from me. <laughs> But I just feel like, you know, you do what, what works yeah. for you and people put pressure on themselves and it might feel like they're not doing well, mm. but you're doing great. Like just, you know, there's nothing wrong with just like having your nine to five job. Mm. You're happy with that. Your bills are paid and you might not feel like you need to do anything else outside of that. That is OK. Yeah. I really just like want to eliminate this culture of like you must be doing so much. You've got to this and do that and do this. No, you don't mm -hmm. actually really don't. Mm -hmm. It's crazy you say that because I was speaking to somebody um, at work and um, it, what they said to me was that, yeah, they're happy with where they are and they don't want to move off or nothing like that. And I hadn't really met anybody like that. Oh, that's quite refreshing. Yeah. To hear somebody say, oh yeah, I'm just, I'm, I'm chill. Out of, I don't want to move up. I don't want to do anything more. I was like, mm. cool. Yeah. Right. Whatever He's happy. Happens. Family's happy. That's what works for him, right? Exactly. So, yeah, no, I completely, completely, completely agree. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. For, yeah, yes. Thanks so much for featuring. And, yeah, thanks so much for just, you know, sharing your experiences, your insights, uh, your career, your businesses. And, yeah, just keep it up. Just keep it up. Thank and like you said, take care of yourself as well, right? Yeah, <laughs> cool. Um, thank you so much, watchers and listeners, for tuning into this episode of the Take Up Experience. I really appreciate you watching. See you next week.